already. So excellent. Well, Tanshi, bonjour. Welcome to Presenting Our Presence. Uh, Presenting Our Presence is a vodcast uh, that features Indigenous peoples, Indigenous colleagues at the U of A, and all the different ways in which we contribute and bring life to the University of Alberta. I'm Cindy Cadet. I'm uh, from Campus Saint-Jean. I will be your co-host today with Dr. Florence Glanfield. So today we are so glad we have Dr. Wayne Clark. And Wayne, I met you uh, at one of Florence's teas, and this is how Presenting Our Presence came to be. You know, we were, as we came together through the pandemic, uh, learning from one another and meeting one another, you know, the idea emerged about, wow, wouldn't it be great just to have one-on-one -on -one conversations and just really highlighting just the incredible diversity of who we are. And it was such a learning for me in those teas, like meeting everyone. And so I remember uh, when you, I first met you on the T and you had just, I think, maybe arrived at the U of A. And it was so great to share that space in that circle. And I was quite excited to learn more about what you're doing and, and having, you know, growing a relationship with you because my work is also in health sciences um, through the University of Ottawa. So thanks for accepting our invitation to join us on presenting our presence and being here with us. I know that you, uh, when we talked, you wanted to speak a little bit about post-secondary institutions, uh, how our Indigenous research helps our communities and, and even ourselves, which is such a huge piece, right? I appreciated that insight you had, how it helps us also as Indigenous people at the U of A. So I'll pass it to you for you to introduce who you are and who you belong to and in a way that's uh, meaningful to you. Terrific. Well, and thank you, uh, Cindy, and uh, thank you, Florence, for inviting me. Um, I'm excited to be a part of POP and, and to share a little bit about myself, given that I am a guest on Treaty 6. And um, so far, I've really enjoyed the experience. Although there is a pandemic going on, um, we are all making the best of it. Um, as Cindy said, I'm Wayne Clark. I'm originally from Churchill, Manitoba and I am Inuk, and uh, I also have European um, ties on my father's side. And my mother's family comes from Tikarakjuak, Nunavut, which is uh, Whaleco. Uh, and um, my um, grandfather was a whaler, and um, being Inuk in Southern Canada can sometimes feel very lonely. But um, in more recent years with more people moving south from the north. Um, I'm finding these communities that are existing in places like Edmonton and Winnipeg and Ottawa, uh, where I've lived. And, and I understand there's also a community in Montreal as well. Um, and so uh, there are about 60,000 Inuit in Canada and about 25% or just over 15,000 um, live in the south. So it's a you know, as a fairly significant amount of the overall Inuit that exists. And so when we compare 60,000 compared to the numbers of First Nations and Métis there are in Canada, we are still a relatively small um, population, but we're a growing population. So we have uh, uh, our, you know, youth are, uh, and, and kids are, are the biggest part of our demographic. Um, and there's been a lot more interest in uh, Inuit culture in that demographic, which is lovely to see because um, people are speaking the language, people are still immersed in culture. So it's always very nice to go back and just experience how rich that is. I eventually started to work with museums and um, that was uh, my entry point into academia because some of the museums where, um, where I worked were part of universities. Uh, and so the uh, first museum that I worked with was the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. So I had a chance to work with curators, um, teachers, you know, researchers, and also the um, North West Coast um, peoples, um, including the Haida and the Kwakwala and the Musqueam. And uh, I had been living away from the North for quite a while at this point in time. Um, but as I got to know the community members, I shared where I was from 
And of course, I was immediately welcomed as another Indigenous person in such a way where um, I had I realized like the significance of that. Um, and then I started to learn a little bit more about the, um, the people who we were working with and recognizing that in um, some of the educational materials that existed in Canada at the time, you know, in the 90s, were, were either inaccurate or out of date. And so, um, it you know, I, I took great uh, satisfaction in creating web spaces um, and online exhibits that were correct, that were factual, and that were done in partnership with uh, the communities that I worked with. Um, and so uh, that allowed me to then go work in Ottawa with Canadian Heritage. And um, I did that work for quite a few years. At a certain point, I, I decided I wanted to, you know, go in and complete a master's degree. And I, I thought I would do it in communications because my uh, of my background. And um, what happened there was my um, my supervisor really suggested that I do a thesis uh, so that if I decided to do a doctorate that I had, you know, the pathway. But it was just at the sort of the 11th hour, I changed it to, um, to thesis track and I had to get the supervisor and the committee, it all happened very quickly. Uh, and then I asked myself, what was I doing? But I was gonna look at um, electronic health. I knew that was what I wanted to do. It was taking what I had learned already working in digital spaces to electronic, and now we call it digital health, but in electronic health. And um, um, you know, telehealth was starting to um, resonate with me and uh, was um, starting to, I guess, be more implemented within the healthcare system. And this was right around the time that the electronic health record was um, being introduced as well, because I've always known about the challenges that existed in communities in the north uh, where there wasn't a hospital. Um, and so um, that's kind of what I looked at in terms of how it could be accessible and, um, you know, be self-determining for um, not only accessing your health information, but but um, owning it. And so, uh, so I looked at, um, you know, how can Inuit um, uh, look at health information in a manner that was commensurable with their worldview. And, um, and this was the, the group that I worked with. Um, so they were from Kivalik and, and the Manitoba Inuit Association. So with uh, the electronic health record, um, it was um, important to me that the community had a significant role and then later I felt part of it because I had um, a need for more um, participants and so I got my um, community like parts of my family in, involved in the process and I, I had to go through the uh, ethics um, to have that approved because of course you know family members you aren't usually part of research but I had learned that you know as, as Indigenous people, um, you know, the participants usually are members of our family because we come from communities where we are related. And the interconnectedness of um, not only uh, the uh, people that are involved, but everything, like from the land to the animals to the cosmos, we were all interconnected. So that was a beautiful thing. Um, and so I started to learn this at the end of, of my journey of my master's degree. But I at first was looking at it like, you know, um, health information data, um, you know, um, very quantitative. And then I moved to uh, more qualitative Indigenous health research. And I was pretty excited about that. So I knew I wasn't done. So um, I took a year off and then I, I went back and did um, my um, doctorate in education, in distance education. So continuing that tradition in um, distributed learning or, um, you know, e-learning as it used to be called. And um, and then again, I was sort of leaning toward looking at, you know, our physicians accessing health information um, and cultural safety training, like looking at the numbers and, and uh, you know, the, um, you know, analytics that would support, you know, a community of inquiry, which is a, a theoretical framework that looks at, you know, online, um, presence and social presence and teaching presence, but it's still looking at, you know, quantifying these in a manner that could uh, be interpreted. 
and uh, and then I realized this isn't this isn't indigenous, even though I'm looking at you know a, a cultural safety module. But I needed to um, go further than that and work with my community to um, so that we could do this and build this together in a manner that was driven by community and wasn't part of continuing medical education standards or other um, you know uh, parameters that were dictated by uh, the academy or by the College of Physicians and Surgeons. So, um, so I was in Copenhagen and there was an, an elder there uh, from my community who was speaking, uh, she was the keynote, Elder Lavinia Brown. And Elder Lavinia was talking about the, um, uh, the prevalence of diabetes, type two diabetes in Inuit communities and how she is afraid that it's going to continue to increase and that there was that we had a problem and we, we didn't um, or we don't have um, access to the same kinds of uh, resources like um, dialysis and um, other kinds of um, you know diabetes education and clinicians in the north and then there's comorbidities related with diabetes that would also require um, you know community members to medically relocate to the south and of course that becomes a challenge because at that point, then the patient, uh, the family, the community member is cut off from, from the community. And so um, I just said, OK, let's create a, a cultural safety module That's because that was also a gap that a lot of the training that exists in cultural safety uh, is has been designed or co-designed with uh, First Nations and Métis with very little um, Inuit content. So we looked at uh, incorporating Inuit Kalyamekka Kanget into, which is Inuit traditional knowledge, and incorporating that into the um, into the framework for how we would um, um, develop the content, develop the module together. So I interviewed um, elders. Um, actually, I didn't interview elders. I had conversations with elders. I used Kovacs um, conversational method. Uh, so elders were leading the. You know, they they talked about what they wanted to share. In fact, I had sort of a protocol with some guiding questions, but you know, it turned out that the elders uh, were in control of that conversation and, and I respected that. There was also a number of, of um, conversations that I had that were um, were in Inuktitut, which I don't speak, so I had to have a, um, um, you know, an interpreter there. Um, and the, the wonderful thing about that was like I, 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 I think I got more out of those than than the English conversations in in a way because I'll just never forget that space that we were in, and how that was, how the um, discussion and conversation was being translated and and seeing the gestures from the elders and uh, the smiles and and the, the the joking and everything that you would think would be part of a storytelling experience was there. Um, and so, um, uh, so I learned as much, as many words as I could so that those were incorporated um, into the, um, uh, the, 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 the study so that those quotes were in Inuktitut where uh, if, if the um, elder had shared something that I wanted to include as a quote, it was put into Inuktitut, right? Um, and, and then I discussed it in the, um, in, in the findings, right, without having to translate it. And I thought, you know, this is really uh, in, like relational um, research that it, really indigenous research that was was relational. I wasn't indigenizing, which I think what I was trying to do with my earlier studies um, and thinking about making this indigenous, but I, I came full circle and it was completely led by the community. Because one of the things after I did with with the elders as I, I created an online um, or a, a draft of the online module and um, and then I took it to um, Kavalik where community members um, shared with me what they what they uh, thought and uh, they were all it was all that was completely done in Inuktitut um, and uh, and some people were kind and, and tried to speak as as much English as they could um, but um, it was mostly in Inuktitut, and um, I, what I did understand was the 
there was so much respect for the elders. Uh, it was confidential, of course, I couldn't share who uh, uh, provided the input into that. But, you know, um, so when they were looking at the, the module, um, they had noticed that it included these uh, videos or stories that were, you know, by certain uh, community members. For example, uh, you know, Inuit storyteller talking about, you know, um, you know, harvesting um, caribou, right? Uh, and uh, they made a note of saying to me, why isn't, you know, an elder introducing an elder? I had an elder like welcoming people to the, welcoming learners to the module, but um, they'd ask me, why don't you have an elder that has type 2 diabetes do that? Okay, very good. So I, I that's the kind of feedback that I got. And so it did, it made it more rich. And um, I was so grateful for that. And while I was doing this work, I, I was working in health because um, I had moved from um, producing uh, media to the health care um, arm of government um, because um, there, there was, was after the economic downturn. And so a lot of these um, cultural positions were, were cut. So, um, so basically I took some time off and it was like I almost moved to another sector within government. And so health was, I mean, healthcare is always hiring. So I just wanna put that out there to anyone that wants to uh, go into the health sciences. Um, there will always be a job for you and there's, a, there's many, many options. You, uh, nurse education, um, you know, you can become a professor of, of medicine. Um, there's um, different, um, like really right across the board, like in administration, um, in human resources, um, and the like. So I started realizing, well, hey, I should be speaking on anti-Indigenous racism in health. Because would that be integrated? I think you're bringing up the element of policy, which kind of upholds how the system functions. And the integration, I mean, I'm always fascinated, but where are these places in this country that integrates Indigenous health knowledge and Western knowledge? And there's a few places we can go to that are doing that work. So part of your role right now as Executive Director of Indigenous Health Initiatives, is it looking, is that one of the elements that you're like looking at those policies? And I love that, that you're bringing us to that. It's like, ah, yes, it's not enough. Cultural safety was one thing that happened 20 years ago. That was like, I remember like in 20, 2007 or 2000 and maybe 12 years ago, that was the big trend. Yes. Almost cultural safety. I had never heard of it really coming, working with Indigenous uh, communities because some of my colleagues who were studying in public health or doing their PhD, it was still kind of coming from a Western lens. Well, yeah, because the Maori nurse that was um, uh, bringing this concept uh, to New Zealand, uh, we had some physicians, um, that uh, went there and studied there and brought this back. And then I think there was some people in Ottawa at Carleton actually that were looking at this. And so that was the introduction. And so then uh, those um, scholars then worked with the National Aboriginal Health Organization. Uh, and then that concept started to circulate, um, but it was it took a while before it became so part of the um, TRC. Um, and then later it started to then okay, we have this baseline of cultural safety knowledge, but then what, what next? So if you look at policy now, yes. that would probably be like, okay, you take this and, and that's sort of your baseline, but then you look at other modules that are specific to uh, either the administrator or the healthcare provider or the scholar or the researcher, depending on what their um, specialty is. Um, so we're even needing um, security guards to have specific knowledge because you know, or, or, you know, the justice system, if I could take it one step further, because um, that's an area where there hasn't been a lot of training. They've brought culture into the institution for the, um, for, for um, you know, they've got those programs there for the inmates, but not necessarily for 
um, the way they, you know, that, that are, that's operated, function. And it's interesting when you talk about the piece also of our, you know, the academic journey of those, the emerging scholarship on Indigenous research methodologies and that whole relational element. Um, and so key, I, I mean, and curious because when I was doing my master's, it was just Kovac was just kind of the first one writing about it. And I mean, at the end of my PhD with working with community on how do we understand good health and good living, it comes down to the methodology, to the approach and how central and significant um, that is to the well-being and health. But it also um, is part of how we, we, I realized how we grew up with grandma and to with the aunties. Like it was actually part of a way of life, which I found interesting to look at the correlation of our health and those approaches that you spoke about, that relational research approach is actually linked to how we live in so many senses. I think that it becomes very apparent when we um, do that research. Um, so it's really beneficial to the community because the knowledge translation from specific studies that are done that way would resonate very um, well with community members and it would make sense to them um, in a manner that um, is um, commensurable with an Indigenous worldview. So that was one of the things I was so excited about when I was working with my community because I could see the light, you know, the lights and um, the excitement and I was thanked so much and I never felt like I had really found myself in the process as well because I had learned about um, some, um, some Inuit um, traditional um, ways of thinking around spirituality and, um, and how we're named after um, our, one of our relatives and, um, and what that means to us and, and how we take on our relative spirit. And sometimes we're named before birth and so we can have a name that's androgynous um, and, we can, uh, and then we connect to um, the spirit world through our breath. And of course, you know, our, the, um, you know, air, um, you know, fills our, our heart, right? Or our lungs and our heart. And that's where our, our spirit lives. So um, I had learned about this um, way of looking at um, resiliency, right? In terms of, of, of belief systems and what that looks like. And so when I went um, home, essentially, um, that's what, like, I just, it was, I could feel that knowledge um, right through me. And so then when I was connecting with people uh, that were involved in my study, it was almost like um, there was a, um, it, it's almost like there was an unspoken words, you know, that we were all on the same page. Um, and, and so the interesting thing too is, you know, when you're in a community, everyone knows you're there and what you're doing there. So before I left, uh, I was asked, like I was, uh, I think my, my plane was leaving at two and someone came to the hotel around 9.30 and said, okay, we're, I'm, I'm taking you over to, you know, so-and-so's house, Auntie Lavinia's house. So uh, I said, well, my plane leaves at two. So, um, no, no, we're going now, right? Okay, I don't ask questions. So I get there and there's, you know, four elders. And so I sit down and I have tea till two o'clock. Um, and that was one of the biggest gifts. That was outside of my study, um, but that was just, like such a wonderful experience and I'll never forget it. It's so important and so beautiful to share those experiences of our research, like you said initially about when we are working with our own communities and, and how it somewhat challenges the Western idea of, of how we do research. But like you said, um, we go home and work uh, with our own communities and that, and with that, we also carry our relational ethics with us, or we will be reminded of our relational <laughs> ethical responsibilities by the old aunties or by our own relatives within that community um, and within our own community. And so I often think about, or if I'm teaching on Indigenous research methodologies or people want to use it, or, you know, it becomes, you know, sometimes it's like we, have to navigate then when we write and just and speak about that work how it gets uh, picked up and used yeah uh, I, I i can't agree with you more or i i agree with you wholeheartedly because it is about the relational methodology but it's 
relate relational ontology and relational axiology. And, and that is in fact, and, and relational epistemology. And it, it kind of looks at what um, Sean Wilson uh, talked about when he, he blended those together in a model that that really resonated with me. But then when I started um, you know, teaching indigenous research methods, I started looked at it from you know, what's relational and what's indigenizing, right? Because the indigenous, so we're at a, a point where we see you know, research that's indigenized within the four research paradigms that you know, currently exist. And I'm hoping that we can get to a point where we have that fifth paradigm in place where we can you know, really um, take a look at maybe some Western studies that have been done with us and then start looking at you know, how can this become, how can we build on that knowledge and reproduce that in a relational way so that it, it, um, it may in fact have um, more significant meaning. I know at least for me it did because I came from another paradigm, right? So once I started doing that work and then I really started to understand and it was, I think what was missing. And I think it's been one of the things that has been taken away from us because our way of, of living and our way of thinking, um, you know, wasn't something that the colonizers wanted to support us with, right? And and it's also such a huge uh, gift and element that we bring, I find, to the academy. Because when, when I started also, I mean, I was not in the same paradigm. I was operating in a very qualitative, um, this idea of CPBR, you know, these kind of community-based research paradigms that were developed for non-Indigenous people to work ultimately within community. And it was only by being community. And they're like, could you put all that away? And uh, we're going to the land. You know, this is where we're going to begin or we're, let's go come have a sweat with us or, you know, let's have tea and and visiting. And so uh, and, and I and it's it's that's the element. And I love your piece. I'm going to have to think more deeply about how the problematics of indigenizing when those met, relational methodologies, like you said, that they're built into us but they're also built into the breath you know it is part of the breath of the bigger breath of life ultimately and how do you indigenize that and say you're using that because i that's when i teach i'll say if you want to use indigenous research methodology ultimately it's about returning home and what does returning home mean you know and it can have all these different meanings and elements to it which you spoke of in, in 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 how that's meaningful to you but the home as the breath even yeah and you know the one thing i would like to also just um add is that what i learned when i went to nunavut uh to Kabbalik, the um the whole concept of of um air and spirit and the mother's womb and the igloo and the igloo's position to the stars and where those stars are uh, and, um, and, and, and the meaning behind stars um, was um, really interesting because when I um, would you know, talk to some of my indigenous scholarly friends, they would also talk to me about stars and, and the, the um, creation stories. And I thought, you know, we are so similar in so many ways. And I always thought, you know, that the, um, as Inuit people, we were so different, but I'm finding in many ways we're, we're very much the same. Oh my goodness, so many beautiful things to think about and teachings and so grateful for this conversation, Wayne. I feel like we need to, it's just a beginning. It is just a beginning. And so it's so great that you're at the University of Alberta now. Oh my goodness, Executive Director of Indigenous Health Initiatives, bringing that beautiful and intelligent and important Inuit uh, knowledge and way of being and your your rich experience uh, with the world. Um, so that's such a gift. So merci uh, for today and your time. Wayne, just so grateful for the teachings you shared with us today and the experiences that you had. As Cindy said, we're just so lucky to have you connected as one of the, um, as part of the community at the University of Alberta. So grateful. Thank you. Matt, no. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. This has been a really um, great experience for me, too. And uh, I feel every day more and more part of the community here. And uh, I feel so blessed to, to be here as well. It will be great to see you in person again.
no big insights once we stop the recording. Okay, please. Okay, I promise. <laughs>